Lord, you are good and your mercy endure forever. And
morning and welcome to True Christian Fellowship. Glad to have everybody this morning. And I am going to take a tithes and offerings. So if you need an envelope, the ushers will bring you an envelope. God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. Amen. TCF, we are blessed, y'all. God is good to this church and he is blessing us. Amen. Amen. And so we thank you for your faithfulness. And you're giving, and uh, we're just going to keep on believing that God's going to send us a, a building or our own home soon, and we're just going to keep on uh, trusting Him and thankful for what we got. Amen. Amen. I'm going to go over the uh, announcements right fast. Raven done one out, but last Wednesday was her birthday. She turned 11, and Rhea's birthday, Rhea Collins's birthday was on Friday. Um, for this today is Ciro's birthday. Ooh. Happy birthday, Ciro. Happy birthday to me. That's right. We gotta sing happy birthday because his birthday is on a Sunday. So Dusty, come here. <laughs> Ciro's birthday today. Will you lead us in happy birthday, please? Sure. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Ciro. Happy birthday to you. Oh, praise God. It's awesome to celebrate your birthday in the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 Yes. <laughs> so, um, intercessory prayer this Tuesday. We're going to do it at home because Misty's still out of town. So, okay, we're going to do it at home. All right, um, Bible study on Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Y'all come. We've been getting some good word. And then on Friday is Axel's birthday. Yay. He's turning three. <laughs> three years old, but he's not here this morning. So y'all just remember little Axel, a little uh, whirlwind is going to be turning three. <laughs> Amen. So that's all I have. Um, does anybody have a praise report you want to share with us this morning? Anything the Lord's doing? Key? Yes, I do. All right. Yeah, I want to just thank him that he gave me the opportunity to go up to Tennessee with Pastor Robert and hear the word. Me and him got to talk. I heard great testimonies up there. It was just remarkable on how the Lord works and how good he is. Amen. And I just want to, just want to thank him for it. Amen. Thank praise God. God. Yes. Amen. God is good. Ms. Juanita. I'm praise the Lord that I was able to uh, talk to my friend about Jesus and get that as his Lord and Savior. And then I got a call from the church as I left, and his neighbor said they found him dead two weeks again. And so that was a week before Sunday. And it kind of it kind of got a little sick me. Because uh, I was going to call him on Monday, and that's when he died, was Monday night. Mm -hmm. uh, they found him dead. He had a massive heart attack. And uh, he has no family, so um, he, I'm so glad that he willed everything he had to his neighbor, because his neighbor being next door would help him do things and take him like the same need him. And I felt like he deserved it. And, I guy kept telling him, pick me to see if he had any family members. I said, the only ones I know of the three that died, three of them died in that trailer. Mm -hmm. His wife, his brother, and then him. I said, uh, you can do whatever you want to, whatever he kind of, he wanted you to have it. He wouldn't have, you know, made no arrangements for you to get it if he didn't want you to get it, and you deserve it. And I thank you for calling me and letting me know. Um, I kind of, beat myself up a little bit because I didn't call him on Monday, but, you know, he could have been dead Monday. We don't know, but there was a reason why the Lord didn't let me call him, but he knows I've been, we've been friends for 23 years. Mm -hmm. I said to leave him, like his wife and his brother, you know, I knew the Lord was taking him up, he was in bad health, he couldn't hardly get around, he couldn't breathe. He kept telling me, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. I said, well, yeah, that he, he's like, I walk funny. And I said, dog, and then the guy asked me, can I ask you one more question? I said, well, he said, will you take Betty? I said, oh, no. 
Especially women, we nitpick things. But if, when you step over there, there's everything that was meant to be, what we were meant to be. There's no more suffering, there's no more pain, there's no more sickness, there's no more disease. What God wanted the, this world to be is in heaven. And then we're going to be with Him, you know, the one who really loves us and created us. So, uh, you know, it's hard to let go, but the people that go on before us, they don't want to come back to this. It's, you know, just think about that when sin was lifted completely. This, 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 the world drags you down. I mean, it's just what it does. Uh, this, we walk, this world is full of sin, and we are the light in this world. And when we get to heaven, it will make nothing but light, nothing but God's glory. Amen? So, you know, we rejoice with those that go on before us, even though there's a time, you know, for grief. And uh, so you just... Trust in the Lord. He'll get you through it. He will get you through it. Yes, Brenda. When you have finally got a big pool. Amen. He's going through a rough time on this side, but he's swollen like a balloon. But this side's healing good, so she's going through a little bit. And plus, she's got to work doing all this. So I just hope God, God's got her. He's going to take care of her. She's doing a little bit better. Amen. Well, praise God. I know she is. Glad well, to have that tooth out, oh, those teeth out. They've been giving yeah. problems for a while. So thank the Lord for doctors and right. dentists and, and everything. So. Having the money and insurance to do it. <laughs> I, yes, yes. Anybody else? Miss Savannah. Well, as y'all know, I have that tooth. Well, not one of but my tooth. my tooth. <laughs> I couldn't even take my entire family in it. <laughs> we had to take two separate vehicles if we went anywhere. But um, I have a mother-in-law who is, is very blessed with a good business that brings in quite a bit of money. So she decided to um, pay for us to get a new vehicle. So I got a Nissan Honda Odyssey. It's a 2021. It's got all the little bells and whistles. There's enough room for all of us <laughs> to go somewhere and all be together. Um, just need to keep on praying that she will, you know, reach her to us. But, um, yeah. also, if you could keep her in your prayers, or really my husband and his brother as well. Um, they lost somebody last night that was very close to them. It was my mother in law's ex husband, who was like a dad for both the boys. Um, the youngest son, he went up or went to California to be there. Um, but, Yes, he passed away last night. Um, I seen it on Facebook because I had to call my husband and tell him. And then um, he was heading over to his mom's house. So she would be like, she's not handling it very well. Her mom's not doing well and has been in the hospital. Her brother's not doing well. He's got cancer. So she's got a lot on her little plate. So y'all just keep her in your prayers. I don't know if the friend who passed away was a Christian. I don't believe so. I know he was a Catholic. Um, I'm hoping that maybe at his on his deathbed that he had his interaction with Jesus and that's where he's at, but I'm not sure. But he was a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, that's one thing to say. The good old boys don't make it into heaven. I know y'all heard that song. And you can be the, the nicest person in this world, but there's only one thing that gets you into heaven, and that's that blood. Accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and that blood applied is what gets you into heaven, not works. But we can, you know, pray for the family. And uh, like she said, you know, hopefully he was able to have that encounter with Jesus Christ uh, before he left this world. And uh, we don't know. God says there'll be people there that we don't think will be there, and then there'll be people that we think will be there that won't be there. 
because it's all about your heart. It's what's in your heart. Jesus Christ has got to be number one in your life. Can't be nothing else more important than him and what he did because he loved us with everything. He gave everything, y'all. And he is the only way we're going to get to heaven. So, And uh, just to kind of piggyback on what she said, I know, uh, to Savannah, I'm very happy for her. God has blessed, blessed her in that area with her faithfulness as far as, you know, being here. And she did need a bigger vehicle because, you know, you need that space. And when you got to carry all the children around, <laughs> and sometimes you got to have a seat for each one of them when they're younger. <laughs> so I'm happy for her that she got blessed. And uh, I guess it's okay for me to share that she doesn't have a payment, y'all. Oh, she so, paid it outright, so I don't yes. have to worry about the payment. Well, right yes, now. so oh, not that's asking. Not. She wasn't you know, having us pay her back or anything. Yes. So See, that's Jesus too. Yeah. I, we like those gifts where there's no obligation to have to pay back. I will, uh, look, you know, so we rejoice with her because we in the, He loves us just as much as He loves Vanna, right? So I'm, I'm excited for her and to see that God did that for. Um, Y'all can come on up. Our God is a good God, y'all. Sometimes you can't see it. Yeah, look through the mess, but you know, but He is there. He's your Lord. He is there. Trust me. So we're gonna lift this up to Him, Father. We just thank you for the opportunity to sow into Your kingdom this morning, Lord. I thank you for each person that's here today, Father, and uh, for those that are uh, able to give, Father God, and for those that are not. I thank you, Lord, that Your Word says you give seed to the sower, and if their heart is to sow, Father God, I thank you that you're going to bring it into them, Father God. And I thank you, Lord, that this church has more than enough to do what you called us to do. I thank you, Father God, for faithful members, faithful givers in this church. Father God, and Lord, for faithful uh, people to work in this church, Father. Servants, people with servants' hearts, Father, to you, Lord. And uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So last week, if you remember, I preached on having freedom in Christ. So I only got about halfway through. So I'm going to finish that this week. Let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer and get into uh, the sermon today. Dear Lord Jesus, I just thank you for this opportunity to be able to minister your word. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for speaking to the hearts of the individuals listening to this. I thank you for opening up their hearts in that way. Your truths, your word can be vested inside of them to where they can bring it up in their daily life as they go through different trials and tribulations. Lord, I thank you for you just being able to speak to us in every situation. And I thank you that this word is going to go on good ground to where people will have it inside of them and know for a fact that we have true freedom in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So my first point I'm going to make, um, you know, I've got lists here. I always listen to the Holy Spirit. And the first thing that the Spirit was teaching me a little bit, and I kind of touched on it a little bit last week, but there's not like a section that says it. But what the Holy Spirit spoke to me is, you know, you can't really have freedom in Christ unless you have total freedom and forgiveness. Because if you don't forgive, you're putting yourself in bondage right away. Forgiveness is the key to freedom. Amen. Why Jesus can love us is because he forgave us of all of our sins. If God didn't do that and Jesus didn't do that, he couldn't love us. You can't love somebody unless you forgive them. Because you automatically put bondage on yourself to where you don't want to be around them. You don't want to speak to them. Uh, you, you don't want to do things that you normally did. So automatically you're tying your hands and tying your feet. And the funny thing is it's, it, it don't have nothing to do with the individual. It has everything to do with you. If you have any type of unforgiveness in your heart or any type of feelings toward anybody, you're only hurting yourself. It doesn't matter to them. Doesn't matter. When you get to heaven, God ain't going to be like, well, they didn't forgive you. He's going to be like, who did you forgive? That's the one whenever he speaks to you and says, if you can't forgive those that you can see, I can't forgive you. 
you know? So forgiveness is the key to walking in love, to doing everything with Christ. If you can't forgive, you automatically just handicap yourself in the spirit. You might as well have just made your spirit man be in a wheelchair. You know, and you can't get the blessings you want and everything else. So the real real uh, thing you got to get when you want to get to freedom is having that freedom of forgiveness. Because if you don't forgive, you're not going to love. You're not going to be happy. Joy's not coming. None of the fruits of the Spirit are coming if you don't forgive. So if you need, if, if you got somebody you need to forgive, the best thing about it is you just say, Lord, help me love them. You love them, I love them. You love them, I love them. I say it all the time. I, I woke up this morning. And there was somebody that the Lord put on my head, in my head that I had no idea that I had anything in. But whenever their name popped up in my head and their face, and it's somebody from my childhood, I was like, ugh, God, I wouldn't want to be around them. Have you ever, you have any people like that? You're like, man, I'm so glad I don't have to be around them. But it's, as soon as I said that, the Holy Spirit said, that's not, you're not forgiven, you're not loving. So I had to, in that moment, this morning, I had to say, Lord, I love them. I don't want that to keep me away from heaven. You don't know what baggage you're holding on to from your past until you let the Lord really deal with you until you really do it and that's when after the Lord was talking to me about that he said what are you really doing in your walk you got to examine yourself that's what whenever he said examine yourself examine yourself you have to examine yourself when you take an exam if you go somewhere it's pretty tight knit you know there's only one answer that's correct there's rarely multiples so you've got to be perfect in this, examining yourself as you see the day approaching to make sure that you're going to be found where you want to be found. Because the fact of the matter is, none of us know when Jesus is coming back. He could, he could come back the instant you get angry. So is it worth it? Now, of course, whenever something hits you, if Jesus came back, that's not sin to you until you dwell on it. Just like if you, you know, lusting and everything else, whenever you have that first thought, you don't have thoughts. But whenever he deals with you and he's talking to you, and you still hold on to stuff, you, you're walking a dangerous path. Your blessings instantly cut off. Ain't nothing he can do with unforgiveness. Because that's all he said in the Bible as far as being able to see him is you have to forgive. So just constantly examine yourself. See. Let him let him prove to you who, who's in your in your life that you don't have. I mean, it probably took me 15, 20 years. There was a boy in middle school who used to pick on me every day when I was in sixth grade. And he was, he was one of my best friends. But he would talk about how fat I was every day. And I was like, you know, you're 11. And I would just laugh with him, whatever, because you don't want to be in middle, you're in middle school, you're starting middle school, you don't want to be that person who's the outcast, right? So if I got mad at him, then I wouldn't have friends because they're the only two friends I had. Um, so he'd pick on me. Then the other friend who's trying to fit in would jump in with him, and they'd just be talking about me. And I'd sit there, and I'd go home, and I'd be like, they're not really your friends. Why do you keep hanging out with them? But I didn't have nobody else. I wasn't popular. Right? Uh, whenever I started middle school, I wasn't somebody who knew somebody. The only thing that people knew when I was in middle school is if I told them that I was uh, Donnie Whippy's cousin, because Donnie was really popular in Henry County Middle. So if I told them that I was his cousin, then they'd you know, want to hang out with me. Even the, the kid I went to school with from the neighborhood didn't really want to talk to me at school because she was popular. Right? So, I mean, you, you get a whole new world when I go from fifth grade where I got like 10, 10 20 friends, everybody in your class, and I go to middle school, I got nobody. But he used to talk, I mean, terrible about me. And, he, you know, he's doing the same thing. When, he, when you get older and the Lord builds you, he's just trying to fit in. And he's trying to make friends. Everybody is. But it took me a long time because I'd think about him. I'd see his face, and I would just immediately be angry. I'd immediately be upset. And, I mean, I don't even, I have no idea where he is. But still, that'd bring it back to me. And so I just had to keep praying, Lord, I don't, I don't want to feel that ache. I don't want to feel that ache. And then, finally, it just, it just came off of me. God doesn't care if you're battling. He wants to know that you're battling in Him. And you don't want to stay there because that's whenever He comes. So full freedom has got to start with you forgiving whoever it is in your life. No matter what it is. Because nobody has had anything done to them as bad as Jesus had done to Him. Um, I mean, He took on all the sins of the world. I don't think anybody's had to do that. So the first section I'm going to start in is... Number six, um, I don't think I got to this, but freedom from fear. I think I stopped at five. Freedom from fear is 2 Timothy 1.7. I'm going to do the NIV first and then the Amplified. Uh, so, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, 
but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So to not have fear, you got to have self-discipline. you got to be disciplined in your walk for Christ. You can't waver to and fro. Because when that happens, fear happens. Fear comes on you when you're starting to waver in the spirit. And then in the Amplified Version, it breaks down a little more. It said, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, timidity or cowardice of craving and cringing and fawning fear. You know, there's people, I mean, y'all might have seen it if you're on social media, but, you know, the new Disney movie Inside Out came out and it's talking about these adults who are my age are putting reels saying that they're crying because they didn't understand that anxiety was doing so much to them. And the Pixar movie showed them that their anxiety is taking control of their life. And I was like, no, anxiety is it's not a fruit of the Spirit. Anxiety is the devil because God doesn't give you anxiety. He doesn't give you that spirit of timidity. You know, that's, that's being a coward. A cowardice is maybe something's being said that you don't agree with and you just sit back and you don't correct it in the instant, you know? I had a, a long time in my life and there's still situations where I come where I don't feel comfortable speaking up and saying what I wanted to say. But you've got to get over being a, being a coward and not saying what you think needs to be said in that moment. You know, if you have a cringing or fawning fear, have any of y'all ever been really scared? Sometimes it comes in the weirdest moments. You know, I've I've got up in the middle of the night, done something, you hear a noise creak, and then all of a sudden your hairs on the back of your spine stand up, and you don't know why you're scared, right? I mean, I, I remember I was laying in the bed one time when I was a teenager, felt like something was over the top of me, I couldn't move, I was in a cold sweat, I was freaking out, right? So that fawning fear has nothing to do with Jesus. If you think about all this stuff like that we allow happen in our life to make us feel bad, it's really just... Pardon me saying it, it's dumb as a Christian to deal with. <laughs> like, you don't have to deal with this stuff. God has already made a way. You don't have to deal with being angry. You don't have to deal with being scared. You just have to deal with getting to Him. He says, we don't have this spirit because He's given us a spirit of power, of love, of calm and well-balanced mind and discipline and self-control. You know, a well-balanced mind doesn't just say what it wants to say. You know, a well-balanced mind is, is disciplined. It thinks about before it speaks. It has self-control. You know, a well-balanced mind doesn't just, for, for me right now, uh, it doesn't just eat whatever it wants to eat. It has a well-disciplined path that you you got to put this in your body if you want to get to a place you need to go. If you're well-disciplined, that's the people. If you always think, I mean, look at the Olympics are coming up at the end of this month. Those people ain't in the Olympics because they just kind of went to the gym. They ain't in the Olympics because they just, you know, well, I'm a good athlete. No, good athletes don't get to the Olympics. If you ever watch them, I mean, they're training 18 hours a day, 12 hours a day. They're eating exactly the same thing every meal to get to the one place where they can, you know, accomplish something. So you're not going to be a well-disciplined and well-balanced Christian if you're not focusing and spending time with God for Him to change you. Because if you don't spend time with him, then you're just a coward, you're craving, you're cringy, and you're fighting with fear. Sure. You know, that, that bill comes in, you didn't know it was going to come, and now you're scared you're not going to make it. Have you ever not made it? I tell them, anytime something happens to me financially, if I've ever gone through anything, I sit there and say, well, you know, I don't have money right now to, to pay for that, but I mean, it's not like I'm going to die and somebody's going to come and kill me because I can't pay for it. You know, what's the worst thing that can happen, Right? Everything, if you, that, I, I really like watching all these videos of they go around, this guy goes around asking really old people kind of about their life and things that they, what do they really, you know, what's important in life, what's different things like that. And almost 97% of the people, their first thing said, if I could tell myself something when I was younger, I'd tell it that, that money isn't really all that it's cracked up to be. Stuff isn't what it's all cracked up to be. Stop wasting your time chasing something and just enjoy the simple things. Enjoy, you know, having your family around. Enjoy those things. That's what you got to enjoy in life. Uh, you know, you can't chase the things of the world. And as you get older, you get more wisdom, and you realize that. Because if you get everything you want, but then you have nobody, what do you really got, right? You're not going to sit there and enjoy stuff just by yourself for too long. I mean, I'm somebody who really likes being alone. I enjoy that time. I, I you know, I'll sit and I'll have stuff that I can do, and I have. 
you know, things I like to do. I like to play video games. I like to watch sports. I like to read different stuff. So, I mean, I have time where I, I enjoy being by myself. Sometimes I drive in the car and I don't even play nothing. I just listen to the tires rolling on the street. And I just sit there and I just, you know, whatever. And it's just a nice 45 minutes or wherever I'm driving, quiet, peaceful time. Um, but even in that, I'm not going to be somebody who wants all this stuff and not ever have any type of anything, but no interaction with anybody. Now, if there's a situation where people can't have somebody in their life, you know, if they're thrown in prison for preaching the gospel, you know, Jesus will come there and clear that. But still, you have to, you know, not strive to want the things of this world because all that's going to bring is no discipline. Your mind is not going to be well-balanced and self-control. If the world had a well-balanced mind, we'd be in a different place right now. Just a well-balanced mind, not somebody who's trying to go and get whatever they want or things of that. Oh, I did have freedom to forgive. That's the next place. I just read right over that. Awesome. Freedom for, to forgive is going to be in Colossians 3.13. We're going to start in the Amplified Version. So number seven is freedom to forgive. It's amazing. You think you think something, and then you don't see it there, and then all of a sudden, boom. I can't not see it. It's kind of how it happens in the Word. Read something a thousand times, and all of a sudden, it's like the big, the word get bolder. Amen. So right here for freedom for forgiveness and amplified, it says, "Be gentle and forbearing with one another." So you have you're telling me right now that I've got to be gentle when I talk to people, and I got to forbear some things that they're going to do to me before I even speak to them. I got to take stuff away before I even have an interaction with them. That frees you right there. If you go in and you know this person is going to do something to me to irritate me, I'm going to work with, I work, you know, in my position, I work right next to somebody. There's going to be something that she does this year that's going to irritate me. You can't be close to somebody like that. There's going to be something that Courtney does to get on my nerves. There's going to be something I do to get on her nerves. You cannot stay close to humans living in this body and not do something to get on somebody's nerves. But when you are forbearing and you already know this, well, then automatically you're ready to forgive. You're ready to just give them love. If you're not forbearing, then you're not ready. And what do you do? You get ticked off. Then all of a sudden, what, what's the first thing that happens whenever you get mad at something? Separation. First thing it is, the first thing you want to do is go somewhere else. Don't want to be around each other. So right there, you just cut off the union just because you can't forgive and you can't love. And it says, if one has a difference, a grievance or a complaint against another, readily pardon in each other. Can you imagine if you pardon somebody, if somebody came to you and you had done something? Because I'm sure that I do stuff to people that I don't even know about. I get on people's nerves without even knowing. Well, all of us do. All of us, the way we act, our personality, just who we are as a person is going to do stuff to get on people's nerves. And I'm sure that I've done that to other people. But if I was readily available for somebody to come if they were going to confront me about what I was doing, and I had no ick in that situation, and I just said, I'm sorry that I made you feel that way. I love you, and uh, I, I'm trying not to do that again, and Jesus is going to correct me to do that. How are they going to respond? How are they going to respond to that? If they want to fight with that, they're going to fight with themselves. You can't fight with Jesus. You can't. You, you ask for forgiveness, you can't fight with that. Because then right there, if they don't want to forgive you, God can't forgive them. You put it all off of you, and then all you can do is you start praying for them. If you have that ready, ready to pardon each other. When you pardon somebody, you take away their sin. If you get pardoned, you know, uh, I know there was the last, they pardoned everybody. When there's a new president, there's always a list of people that they pardon. And they get out of the, whatever it is, whoever they're running from, it probably has something to do with who gives them the most money and who they're backing. But when they get pardoned from that, it's the death taken away. You know, the, the whatever debt you had to pay 25 years, 30 years ago. So you got to pardon each other in, in that way, knowing that whatever they do against you, you can't hold on to it. And even as the Lord has freely forgiven you, so must you also forgive. So right there, you don't forgive, you ain't going to be, you, you're not going to see him. <laughs> like you are not going to see him if you don't learn how to forgive and love people. And then the... Uh, NIV version, it says, Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And you have to know how the Lord forgave you. What did he do? On the cross, he took everything away. 
Because if he doesn't take it away, when you stand before him, that's all he's going to see. So he has to take it away so that way he sees him. And then in the Passion Translation, it says, Tolerate the weaknesses of those in the family of faith. Y'all know I got some weaknesses that I need y'all to tolerate. I'm going to have some things, and we're in the family of faith, that I'm going to need you to tolerate that I might not even know is a weakness. Instead, what people, especially in church, want to do is we want to target and pinpoint because we got a little bit of word knowledge. Nobody has an abundance like Jesus. All of us think we're just so smart in the word and we know everything, but we automatically pick on people's weaknesses. Well, why are you correcting me with this whenever you, you eat what you want to eat? Why are you correcting me with this whenever I know you have a drinking problem? Why are you correcting me with this when I know you smoke? Why are you correcting me with this whenever I know that you uh, lived with somebody before you got married to them? Why am I correcting with you, you with this whenever you've been divorced two or three times? Why are you doing it? says right here you've got to tolerate the weaknesses of people. I mean, God used David, and David was on top of a roof, saw a woman who was bathing and killed her husband. And he was talking to God at this time. He was a man after God's own heart. You think David's in hell because he did that? No, he's not in hell because he, he followed Jesus. He followed God the rest of his life because forgiveness came in where that was because his heart was to change. God knows that you we are in the flesh. Look at man throughout history. Look at the Bible. Men throughout history in the Bible that's wrote on, a lot of them had problems with lust. A lot of them had problems with money. A lot of them had problems with this. But they're not going to be in the Bible unless it specifies. I, I feel like most people who are written in the Bible is going to be in heaven, right? Wouldn't you agree? So if Jesus is tolerating our weaknesses. Why don't we do that with other people? If someone gives you a word from the Lord, it's best just to shut your mouth and just go, go with it. Because you're going against something that's, you know, not from the Lord. And it might not sound what you want to hear in that moment. You know? I mean, think about think about this. I mean, we've had times where I've been on a, on a diet and I've told Courtney, well, you know, help me out. You know, tell me, you know, I don't need to eat this. You know, whenever I want to eat that and she tells me that, and don't feel too good for me to be, I'm just like, who are you to tell me? I'm grown, right? You automatically want to think that. You automatically have a wall built up. I want to eat what I want to eat. But all, you're the one who asked them to help you. <laughs> Be mad at yourself. You know, you need some of that accountability. Yes. You know, so you have to have the weaknesses and tolerate those. And then it says forgiving one another in the same way that you have been graciously forgiven by Jesus Christ. Because I don't know if y'all, I mean, I've asked this a few times. I don't know if anybody's 100% Jew in here. But we've been forgiven much because we've been allowed to come into heaven as Gentiles. I mean, who knows with the bloodline, we might all have some gene in us by now. I mean, there have been so many things with the world going around and everything else. But still, you've been forgiven much. And if you find fault with somebody, release this same gift of forgiveness to them. That's You know, there's a verse in the Bible we've read many times that says it's like dropping hot coals on their head. If you love somebody and you forgive them, you're dropping hot coals on their head. What I think to that is that either going to make them matter <laughs> Because hot coals can make that fire burn, or sometimes at the end of that charcoal, they're still hot, and it kind of simmers down, right? You do a charcoal grill. But either way, that's going to make them more mad, more angry. If you just love them and forgive them, there ain't no reason. You know, if they're like, I know that I was mean to you, I know that I was this, I know that I was that. Especially somebody, imagine if somebody stole money from them, and you went and gave them more money and told them you love them like Jesus. That floor them right there. You know, they wouldn't know what to do. So you can't hold this stuff against people if you want to have true freedom. Because if you don't have that, then you, you're not free. You can say it, you can speak it, you can do whatever you want to do, but it's not going to happen. That's why the best videos, I think, is whenever somebody's had something terribly wrong to them, they got somebody on death row, they've murdered somebody in their family, done these horrible things to them, and the people who get up there and say, I, I, I forgive you for what you did. Because if you realize that the father of the world, the devil, is in control of everything. It's really not the person who did it to you. It's really not them. It's the enemy that put that in their mind, and they didn't have the right tools to fight that. Because there's not a person in the world who has not thought a horrible thought at some point in their life. 
I mean, I've had thoughts growing up, whatever, especially you're young, a friend does this to you, I'm going to take this bat and knock him upside the head. Did I know that if I knocked him upside the head that I could possibly crack their brain and kill him? No, I was too young. But that's still a terrible thought, and it's happened. So you, you can't have that. And, and not be able to have, extend that to somebody else. You've got to be able to free yourself from that because just like Jesus freed himself from us having that. Because if you look, would, would any of y'all die for all the world right now looking at all the crazy stuff? I mean, sure, you might die for your family. Everybody says, oh, I'll die for you. I love you. But that's only the people you love. Jesus died for people that you wouldn't want to die for. Would you die for Hitler if he was in the 1940s? Because Jesus did. You know, would you die for Pharaoh back in the times when he was killing all the Jews? No, but Jesus would have. That's real love. When you can die for people who you don't have any association with and no fleshly thing for, when you can say, I'm going to die for them. You know, and I, I've got to get freed in that a little bit because I've told some of the kids, we do those shooting drills, and I told one boy, he was talking during that, I said, boy, I said, with these 23 people in here and me, if you talking and it was a real shooter, I'm throwing you in the hallway. <laughs> I said, I'm throwing, you know, all these other teachers are getting shot up for all these kids. I always thought, I was like, man, these kids are terrible. Why in the world did you put your life on the line and get shot for them? Like, I see all these kids, and I'm like, well, I just couldn't, in my head, I couldn't do it. But Jesus did. You know, he, he did. But whenever you think that, then what you're thinking about is my life is more important than somebody else's when you have those thoughts. So the Lord has to constantly change your mind. I didn't even know it was sin for me to say that out loud or something not right until just now in this moment preaching. <laughs> the Holy Spirit just brought that up to my mind. Just preach it so you can get corrected all the time. Amen. And you should be happy when he corrects you so that way he can change the way you're talking so everything can be perfect. Amen. Unforgiveness can lead to sickness you don't know about and everything. You can't have it like mentally. People are in, you know, talking to counselors, being on all these pills. I mean, my goodness, just love them. If you just love people, you're going to be free. Like, they got all these little things I'm seeing, too. You know, if you're on, I'm only on Instagram probably like 30 minutes, but man, I can see like a thousand videos because it's so short. There's like camps now where husbands and men and wife go and they're just screaming out loud because they're so mad at their spouse. Or they've been harboring so much for so long and they just have them yelling into the ground and everything else. And I'm like, thank God I know you, Jesus. That's just what I think. Thank God that I'm that I'm born again. Thank God that I don't care what people do. That something might hit me, but I'm quick to get back. You know, I might have things that happen, but I'm quick. I'm as quick as I can be, and as I get older, I want to be quicker. You know? I mean, there, people look, you know, and people talk about me and Courtney and all this blessings and everything else. The only reason why that happens is because we know to be quick to forgive each other. We're just not going to hold stuff against each other. That's the key to anything. With any relationship you have, it doesn't have to be husband, wife, could be friends. If you are quick to forgive, then it's going to be fine. If there's somebody in your family, somebody, friends, that if they came back to church, you'd still think about stuff that they did in the past when they were at church, you ain't got it. you got to forgive them. you got to love them. I mean, there's people that I really love who came to church, and if they came back, I don't ever have an ick when someone walks back in. I can honestly say that. I don't have an ick. I'm happy. And I'm happy to see them. I'm happy they're here because I know that some part of them is turning to Jesus. Amen. And you can have certain types of ick with people, but, man, it is so much better. When, even if someone's living out there in the world, when you see them in church, than having to never see them. So much better to see them come. You know, I mean, it's, it's been a while now, so I feel a little comfortable when I do it because he's not here. He might be watching the but uh, I know Donnie did, he, it was a while ago, I, I don't know when, but I know something happened, and something was said, and he, you know, everybody, you know, we in our flesh, he went off the handle, with it, and it was probably a couple months after he started coming, and uh, I just texted him, the Lord said, just send him a message and see if you can talk to him, and uh, in my head, I was like, well, I ain't no reason to talk to him right now, because he's upset, but the Lord, I said, all right, so I texted him. And as soon as I'm on the phone, he's apologizing to me about, are, you know, the first thing he says, are you mad at me? I said, never. I never mad at you. I can't be mad at you. That's not Jesus to be mad at somebody. You know, and he's talking to me on the phone and he's saying everything else. I said, ma'am, 
I said, the only thing that's happening is right now is the devil's wanting you to cause yourself to pull yourself out. The devil's wanting you to choose to not stop coming. I said, I get forgiveness every day just about. Even if I don't know if I did something wrong, I pray at night, Lord, if, if there's any unforgiv- if there's anything I've done against you, forgive me. It, bring it to light. Teach me. Stuff I'm battling. If, if there's anything, keep it from me. Tell, help me, Lord. Help me. I was like, I ask forgiveness all the time. And he was saying, you know, he said something. He's like, yeah, but people in church probably saw or heard and they're going to hold stuff again. I said, who cares? I said, even if they do, who cares? I said, this is your life. This is your salvation. This is you getting to Jesus. It has nothing to do with anybody else but you. Doesn't matter. I'd rather, and I, I think I told him, I said, I'd rather you come to church doing everything in the world than not come to church at all because at least you have some part of your ear listening to Jesus than totally shutting them off. And I was like, the enemy's just trying to take you out, keep you away from church. He doesn't want you to stay in church. And that's what you got to do to people. You got to love them. You got you to gotta love people. Even whenever you don't want to make a phone call, you don't want to text somebody, you just have to love them. And a lot of times you're going to have to love them in a real walk. You have to love them in their weakness. You know, Jesus told Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Do you think that in Jesus' flesh that felt good when God told him that this person you've loved, you've taught for years is going to deny that they've ever known you? Jesus probably didn't feel great when he heard that from the Lord, but he was so walking in love, he just told Peter with a smile, you're going to deny me three times. Peter said, no, I'm not. He said, yeah, you are. Just kept going. There's nothing else in the scripture where it's like Jesus held that back. As soon as he came back, he went and saw Peter. He didn't have anything against Peter. And that's what you've got to have in life. Jesus is teaching you how whenever people close to you, like your family turn from you, your friends, the church body turns from you, how to love them because he did it with his disciples. He knew Judas was going to kill him, essentially. And what did he do? He still let him come up and give him a kiss on the cheek. He still told him he loved him, and he knew what was going to happen. If you knew somebody was going to come to you, and that was the last thing he was going to do, and he was going to go die, would you be able to love him? You could if you're in Jesus, because that's what he showed you to do. So Jesus is showing you, even throughout his walk with his disciples and everything, Real freedom is having that forgiveness because that's when you can love somebody. You know, probably not your mom, but you can see what kid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you're in your flesh, I mean, Jesus probably, you know, part of him probably wanted to. He probably would say, God, can I roundhouse him a little bit? He might have had those thoughts. You know, it doesn't happen to me now, but he knew the bigger picture. He had a mission. Amen. And when your thoughts is on heaven, this don't matter. It doesn't matter what anybody does. It wouldn't matter if somebody came in and cussed you out. You'd just be like, ha I'm going to heaven. Praise the Lord, I'm going to heaven. Keep cussing if you want to. I hope you get saved. I hope you get saved, get forgiveness. I love you, you, you know, all that stuff. People can't fight with that. Now, what you got to watch out for in your righteous righteousness and your, your Christian walk, you can't meet them with, with Jesus. You know, you have people, I've seen people, you know, talking the right things with Jesus, but then they're yelling scriptures back at the person yelling at them. You're not getting anywhere with that. Jesus said he was, he, you know, he, he says his yoke is easy. His burden is light. You're not going to get to somebody with some anger, even if it's Jesus' anger. You might be saying all the right things, but the tone of your voice to change some things. You know, I think Jesus was pretty, I think he was powerful, but I think a lot of his sermons were probably soft-spoken. You know, he was probably very, very, very nice with people and loving them. Wanted them to accept them. What would you rather do? Would you rather come to somebody and love them? Now, he was truthful with them. He said, you know, he told them everything. He told the Pharisees, your father's the devil. I think Jesus just looked at him and talked to him just like this. Your father's the devil. That's, that's the devil. That's, that's the devil. It has nothing to do with Jesus. Now, they got mad. They started gnashing their teeth. Does it, does it say Jesus rose back and started gnashing his teeth and doing the scriptures? The only time it says he got angry and sinned not was when they was making a mockery of the house of God. And he was cleaning out everything. I haven't seen anybody coming in here selling stuff, setting up a market for us to be able to get angry. So if you get angry, you sin it. So get it right. Amen. <laughs> Number eight is freedom to worship. And this is in John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. And we'll start in the Passion Translation. It says, From here on, worshiping the Father will not be a matter of the right place, but with the right heart. So it doesn't matter where you're at when you worship God. It matters what's your heart when you're worshiping. 
when you have a hard, callous heart, it don't matter what you see. I don't care. I, I've been in church long enough. I don't care if you run. I don't care if you do a backflip. I don't care if you laugh for an hour and a half. I don't care if you fall out and say you've been slain in the spirit for three hours and saw John the Baptist. doesn't matter to me. I don't, I've, I've seen too many people. I've seen holes in walls. I've seen uh, people flip their, have their dress unbuttoned in front of the church and everything else. I mean, I, I've seen all this stuff, dancing for the Lord, Holy Spirit, and everything. And then you know what else I see? I see them leave the church. I see uh, their marriage break up. I see all this stuff. So obviously, a lot of that was shown. God might have been trying to do something in those moments, but they didn't use it. They didn't go to him, right? That, that, ain't, that ain't what happened. He said, it's a matter of the right heart, not the right place. For God is a spirit, and he longs to have sincere worshipers who worship and adore him in the realm of the spirit and in truth. So not only does he want you to worship him, he wants you to worship him in Jesus, because Jesus is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. So you can't worship God right unless you're in Jesus and have all those all that away from you. You can't even worship him right. Now the Holy Spirit can come on you. I mean, I've had stuff where I've been heavy in services. It hit me and then lifted off of me. Sure, that can happen. But I wasn't worshiping right before then. I've had plenty of times coming in here where I'm like, man, I wish I was just somebody who just came to church. Like, I wish I could just come in this morning, sit down, have somebody else sing songs, and you just go on. But... That's not me worshiping in Jesus. So you got to have a right heart, right mind, so that way you're focused on worshiping him. If you really focused on it, if everybody focuses on him, that's whenever revival starts. But then what happens is we try to pervert it in our mind anytime revival starts, and then we try to make it something that it's not. And people are clinging, longing for this stuff, and then they come in with the wrong hearts and wrong motives. When if you just worship in Jesus, revival happens instantly. Revival, revival doesn't have to be everything else. It, you know, Jesus moved. It came with compassion. He had compassion in his heart. If you really have compassion, people really love him. It's going to be easy to worship. It's going to be easy to forgive. It's going to be easy to do all this stuff if you really have that. And you might be somebody who's battled a lot and had a terrible life and is really hard-hearted. But you need to just be praying, Lord, open up my heart. Open up my heart to love them. Because it says, out of the mouth the heart leaks. And who's supposed to be in your heart? Jesus, if you're born again. So Jesus should be leaked on everybody that you speak to. Some edifying words, not downgrading people, not joking around and everything else. You should be uplifting people. In the Message Bible, it says that it's who you are and the way that you live that count before God. Nothing else. Just who you are and how you live. He don't care if you have the nicest shoes he don't care if you got a good car. He don't care if you got a nice house. He don't care that you've been you've been a great tither and everything else. He don't care all this stuff that you've if you built stuff for the church. If you've done all this, no, it's it's who you are as a person. And a lot of people don't get to know who people are individually unless you're around. You're not going to even get to know who Jesus is unless you spend time with him. So that's what counts before God. Your worship must engage your spirit. In the pursuit of truth or in the pursuit of Jesus. So your spirit is longing to pursue Jesus even in worship. That's the kind of people the Father is out looking for. Those who are simply and honestly themselves before him in their worship. So just being there, not to to sound good, you know, for whenever I first started, I was always thinking, you know, somebody could walk into church and I could get a Christian record deal and you know, maybe our band will do this and I won't have to do this and I'll just be able to go play in stadiums or whatever, blah, blah, blah. You have, have all these dreams. Um, but now whenever I come in, I, I really just focus on what's, what are these songs saying? What am, I, what am I saying to you? What am I going to get out of this? What am I singing to Jesus? Because if you're not focused on what I'm singing to Jesus and you're trying to do a performance, you've already cut your blessings right there. It's all about what am I doing for him. It doesn't matter if you play the drums. It don't matter if you play the bass. It don't matter if you play guitar. It don't matter if you've been a singer up here. You've done all this stuff. It don't matter if you've been an usher. That's just something you should do. It matters what is your personal relationship with him and why are you doing it. Why did the Lord lead you there? Did you really hear him or are you trying to push something that you want to push? Because, <clears throat> I mean, who knows? If somebody would have came in, where would I be right now? I don't know. 
I have no idea. That's a, that's a whole other thing where you can see things in the world that you have no idea that are even out there, even exist, be exposed to things that don't exist. A quiet and peaceable life is in the Bible. Amen. Quiet and peaceable. Sometimes just having quiet, having peace is all you really need. You don't need everything else. And it says God is sheer being him it's or is sheer being itself spirit. Those who worship him must do it out of their very being, their spirits, their true selves in adoration. So you have to constantly be in your true self and your spirit worshiping Jesus. You thought you could just come in here and mouse and catch these songs. No, nope. you gotta connect to him if you really want him to touch you. You know, people don't know how to connect to Jesus, and a lot of times that's why stuff doesn't happen. Because you don't know how to get your spirit in line with his spirit. But that's whenever he says, come, come to me, come to me, I'll give you rest. You can ask me what you will, and I'll do it for you, because your spirit's connected. You know, I can ask Courtney about anything in the world, because we're real connected. And I know that if we can do it, she's going to be like, yep, yeah, let's go. You know, financially, whatever, if that's how connected Jesus, God, wants you to be with him. So that way, whenever you ask him, he's like, oh, yeah, I'm doing that. I'm doing that for you. Because it's not out of what you want. It's out of what he wants. And then in the NIV version in this uh, set of scriptures, it says, But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. So worshiping him in spirit and in truth, that does not mean doing backflips and everything else. Like, I've been hit by the Holy Ghost just sitting in the chair. I've been hit by the Holy Ghost just driving to school. I mean, I, I remember there'd be times where I'd drive down, you know, when I drove to Gordon and I lived up here, it was like a 50 minute drive. Every time where I'd be sitting there like, gosh, my eyes are going to be bloodshot. I've been crying for 35 minutes. Song hits and spirit hits you, you know, whatever. That's when you're really worshiping. It's not a performance. Too many people want to be a performance. He doesn't say you got to do things well. He just says you got to worship him with your spirit and you got to worship him in Jesus. If you're in Jesus and you worship him, he cannot do anything but inhabit your praises. He says, I inhabit the praises of my people who are his people, the ones who come here and do what Jesus says. So if you're not feeling Jesus in your prayer life, in your worship life, then you need to get you out of the way because he can't not come. You know, that's, that's with anything. If you come to prayer, if you go anything, and you're coming and you're thinking about what you're doing later, he ain't there because you're putting yourself above him. You know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta do what you want to do. Uh, that that mentality. You know, I want to do what I want to do. I want to go to church, but I only want to take up this amount of time in my life. I want to want to live for you, and I want to get to heaven, but uh, I only want to do this much in my life. I only want to give you this slice, but I want everything you got. So really, you're just being greedy and selfish with God. I don't want to live for you all the time. I just want to kind of get that dose of that high to make me feel like I'm doing good. Post those cute pictures of my family on social media that were here for Easter. or Look at Cutie's outfit. But then I'm dealing with depression, guilt, everything else for the rest of the day because I really don't have a relationship with you and I'm going to split hell wide open. That's not what God's looking for. He doesn't care what you wear to church looking pretty. He doesn't care what you do at church. He doesn't care what you do in your life. He cares that you do it for him. He doesn't care what your job is. All he cares is that you do it for him. I could be sweeping the floor of McDonald's and I would do it tomorrow for the rest of my life and live in a shack if I knew that's how I was going to get to heaven. Because this life doesn't mean nothing. <laughs> it, it really doesn't. Like the only thing I want for my family and y'all in here, because y'all are part of my family if you didn't know. So if you don't like me, get over it. <laughs> you'll, be over, you'll be with me for a long time <clears throat> forever we love you. but uh, the only thing I want is for all of us to be to heaven because what, what is true Christian fellowship what is your family if you don't get to spend forever with them right all these churches that have people what is, what is it for why, why would I want to get to heaven and keep something to myself which is really what pushed me to be like oh, I guess I can preach because I don't really like doing this to be honest with you so like, you know, I tell Courtney the whole time, I said, I, I hate having to preach until I get up there and then I get going and it goes. So I'm just like, I'm just following what the Lord says. I hope people like what I say. <laughs> I hope he's speaking through me, really. Not like liking what I say, but I hope he's using me, really, is, is what it is. But, you know, but what is it? what would it matter if I got to heaven and held all this information in and I didn't get nobody to heaven with me? 
What would it matter if I, if you live with somebody every single day and they don't get to heaven, but you live with them every single day? Do you think people who live with Jesus didn't end up in heaven? Besides Judas? I mean, that's about the only one. People who live with him every day, his brothers, his sisters, his mother's people who saw him, no, they knew. They knew something was different. They saw the way he lived and he taught them how to live. You know, if I hold grudges now, Marley's going to hold grudges when she's older because it's going to be learned behavior. If I hold things against her, she's going to hold things against me. It, it, I mean, all it is is a cycle. So you, somebody's got to break it. Somebody's got to break the cycle, and that's Jesus. He says he breaks all chains, and that's just part of the chains. What can people do when you just tell them you love them? Nothing, unless they just end the devil. Then just let them, let them go. Was that, oh, i got to get 24. Keep going. That was a good one, though. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. It's amazing. All these versions say in your spirit and in truth, and we know Jesus said, I am the truth. So you have to worship him in Jesus. If you don't worship in Jesus, you worship him in yourself. and That's just like having a stench go up to heaven. You know, there's millions of people in this world who sing better, play better than me. Millions of people. There's a lot better setups than I've had sometimes in this with stuff going out. But when I tell you that I just know how to get to them if I need to, and that's what you got to know. I know that I can get to the Spirit when I need to get to the Spirit. <laughs> Man, it's so good. <laughs> Sorry. It's all right. Oh, man. It breaks everything. When you just get to them. And even if you're holding stuff against people, man, it just breaks you. I mean, if I'm, if I'm honest, like, before everything happened, with Robert, there was stuff that I was holding against him. But man, as I stayed there, it just broke. And the Holy Spirit just broke it on me. And it and it was just, I mean, really, if I'm honest with everything, try to be. It was it might have been a bad time in the natural. But our relationship right before he left had never been better. Met, I mean, it had never been good times, but man, we were so close, so tight, that it just, it would have never been better. I knew stuff that was happening with him that other people didn't know. Like, I was just so connected with him, and I could just, I would just watch him, and I'd, I'd know. And really, that incident, you know, I had, I had known it a little bit with, when we went through it with Courtney, you know, and her dad, I think in the life short, but I mean... Whenever that happened, I was like, man, life's too short to hold on to crap. It really is. To hold on to stuff with people, man. You just, Jesus, all he did was love us. That's that's all he did, and that's all he wants you to do. And the only reason why you don't love people is because you're thinking about you. You're thinking about what you want. And sometimes you just got to be able to get to Jesus. And I can do it by myself in a room. I can do it in a car. I can do it with a messed up guitar. Uh, you know, I can do it anyway. Jesus don't care how it sounds. He cares what your heart is. You know, just get to him. That was good. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I don't like crying, but it ain't, ain't always bad. The next thing we have, number nine, is freedom in our community or in our church. This is Acts 2.42. We're going to start in NIV. It says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So they devoted themselves to what was being taught to them. That's what you got to do in this walk, to have freedom in your community. you got to devote yourself to what's being taught up here, what's being spoken in the Word. Because anytime, it don't matter if you like the way someone preaches or not. When they're preaching the Word, you got to latch on. <coughs> There's been many preachers and ministers that I didn't enjoy their style. I don't like certain things <coughs> they do being in church, but it doesn't matter what I like about them personally, how they preach. It matters what they're preaching. And I can always, at a young age, I can pull something out, the Holy Spirit would be just, they'd be reading something, and he might give me a revelation of something that has nothing to do with their sermon, but just was spoken right to me from the Scripture. 
So you got to constantly be there. Breaking bread with people and praying with people, that means you're in love with them. You ain't going to want to break bread with somebody you're irritated with. That you're not loving, you're not going to forgive. I don't want to sit at the table that I, I hate, right? I mean, I can only think of one person in my mind right now that the Lord's helping me with. <laughs> really. <laughs> I mean, and I'm going to get better, better with that as it goes. And I, I can honestly say I don't hate the person. There's just still a little bit of ick there that the Lord's helping me out with. So in uh, the Passion Translation, and I don't sit in the ick. You know, I might say that there's some ick there, but I don't live my life in the ick. It's just if I think of that person, I still know that the Lord's dealing with me. You know, there's different in saying, like, some people might take that and say, well, that's the sense of, okay, to have some ick towards somebody. No, I'm not saying that. It's sin. To dwell on that. Every time I think about it, I'm constantly dealing with it in the Holy Spirit. Then he frees me from it. And then if it comes back and I feel that ick, he frees me from it. Come back. It's not just sitting in that ick. It's getting freed from that ick. You know? And you might not. There, Like I said, people probably have people in your life you don't even know that you have a little bit of ick towards it for no reason. You know, one thing I think about is it says don't uh, give discourse among the brethren, but you can see that in your physical life. If you have somebody who's a good friend of yours and you have never met somebody that they talk to you about and tell you bad stuff about, what do you automatically have? You don't have a good thought of that person, but you don't even know that person. You have no, you have no bearings of who that person is. You might really like that person and have a different relationship with them. Right? I saw this big whenever I went and started working with Courtney at Tuss Hall. There were people she had never talked to in the building. And I talked to them and talked to people she didn't talk to. And I was like, I was like, ain't nothing like that. <laughs> you know, you, we just don't know, them, right? I was like, you know, other people had told her, don't talk to these people in the building. So she's like, this, I've been warned about these people. You know, don't do it with them. And I'm like, I talk to them all the time. I don't know what that person was talking to me about. I don't know what they had. But I was like, I have nothing against them. But I mean, honestly, <laughs> that's how I stay. Is I try not to have anything against them. If they have certain situations with them, if they have certain certain issues, I just forgive them ahead of time. <clears throat> I'm like, there's certain things people do that's just their personality. That's what you gotta realize, man. There are certain things that people do, and it's just them, and you gotta just be all right with it. You know, no matter how much you like Pastor Skills praying for you with his ring finger, you gotta love him because I have never walked with that thing a few <laughs> times. And I'm just like, man, praise God you can take that ring off Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> I need prayer again. Can you pray for my head? I just got a contusion. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, there's just certain things people do. There's certain things people, way people say things, and they don't mean anything by it. But you take it a different way, and you got to deal with that in the spirit. And that's staying in your community. That's coming together regularly. So right there, that can, boom, tell you, you need to come to church. It says regularly, <laughs> you know, and, and, so, and you got to come regularly for prayer. Oh, you went to the next version. I was like, that's reading different. It says every believer was faithfully devoted to following the teachings of the apostles. So faithfully devoted. What are the teachings of the apostles? They're teaching what Jesus taught them, so they're being faithful to Jesus. Their hearts were mutually linked to one another. Are you mutually linked to somebody? You should be mutually linked to everybody in this church in some way. If they called you needed prayer, different things. You should be able to hear stuff from the Lord that you speak into their life. You know, it's not always people up here who are preaching that make a church good. You know, I bet the apostles were preaching to each other when Jesus wasn't preaching to them. You know, one of them would say something and one of them would be like, no, that's not what he said. Jesus said this. This is what Jesus said. You got to constantly come to them, you know, mutually linking up with them, sharing communion, coming together regularly for prayer. So he's telling you right there, you got to pray with each other regularly. You know, if you have problems in your marriage, start praying with each other. I need to start doing that. Just found that out. That's awesome. <laughs> I love being corrected, especially when I know it's going to take me up. That's what you got to think. Being, when you're corrected from God, he's just taking you places that you ain't been. And anywhere you ain't been, Jesus is good. It ain't like places you ain't been in the world. You know, we could all take a trip to New Zealand. That's one of the places I want to visit. But all of our trips will be different. But if you go up in God, it's, it's all good. In the Amplified Version, it says, 
and they steadfastly preserved, devoting themselves constantly to the instruction and the fellowship of the apostles, to the breaking of bread, including the Lord's Supper and prayers. So you got to preserve this life. If you see somebody trying to pull you out or say something, they get irritated, they get mad, they get frustrated. Well, I mean, you've you got to preserve it. I mean, newsflash, look around the church. I mean, we're about half as full as it was last year. What does that mean? I mean, some people got a little upset for whatever it was. Do I care what they got upset about? No, not at all. I don't ever care why someone's mad because Jesus don't care why you're mad. He just cares that you, they love them. I don't care why they got mad. I'm just here to love them. Whenever they, whatever happens, you know, you got to believe that what's spoken on good ground can't go away. So I just believe that whatever they've heard, whatever has been said, they can't get away from it. And God's going to know when to bring that back up in their life. You know, if, if Robert would have been raised in church, he wouldn't have been known to come back to nothing at the end. And there was a lot of times you might have thought where it wasn't planted on good soil. You know, I mean, I had, I had heard a, a long time ago uh, that Mr. Philip uh, Courtney's dad, my father-in-law, he said he was in tent revivals, he sung and all this other stuff. Man, we had a good old conversation about that. He said, yeah, man, he said, uh, he was talking, it was just, it, I, I just miss his personality, man, because he would just sit there and, and, and talk to me and he'd be like, he just looked at me one day, he said, you know, you know, Dustin, I might not do it a lot, but I've got the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and I said, I said, I, I believe you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Philip, I believe you. He said, yeah, he said, uh, he said, you know, you remember, because they had came to church for a little bit after we got married, and he said, you know, uh, Dad talks about tent revivals, I was in those. He said, man, I got knocked out in the spirit, I had all this stuff happening and everything, and all this stuff in my life, I sung in them, I've done everything. You know, Courtney found out he was, he was a heck of a roller skater, like after, after he had passed away, she had no idea he roller skated. But he was like the man. He had trophies for roller skating wow. in the roller ring. Like he could do all that stuff, apparently. And I'm like, I bet you could. <laughs> I'm like, I bet you was getting it, too, out there roller skating. But, uh, you know, he told me about that and everything else. So as it got toward the end, you know, I just wanted to make sure, because in the natural, you know, I had known that they came to church, they had not been to church, you know, all this other stuff. We just wanted to know that he was going to heaven. And, uh, you know, that I knew that the Lord was not going to not answer our prayer. You know, I knew if I followed him, the Lord was going to answer the prayer so that way we would know that we would know that we would know because he had been with them. You know, people who have been with him in their life, Jesus ain't just going to let them go. <laughs> you know, he plants seeds in your life for a reason. <laughs> you know, there's a re it doesn't matter. Some of y'all might remember a time in your life where you didn't have anything to do with Jesus and you just decided to go visit a church. You decided that's a seed that's being planted. You know, I'm, I'm sure Uncle Keith had no idea what he was getting into whenever he hung out with a guy at the pool house. <laughs> Probably had no clue. But God was orchestrating stuff, right? You have no idea what, what God is doing to where you're going to get, right? I mean, you just you just got to keep going and doing what you're supposed to do. I had no idea that, of course I didn't. I was being born that I almost died and I'd be here today, but God did. You know, all the stuff that, that's happened in my life, I had no idea where I was going to be, but God did. He orchestrates that stuff. But when he, when Mr. Philip went into a coma and we didn't know if he was going to wake up, we thought he was going to pass. You know, he was on everything. I think he was on a ventilator and everything in ICU. I was never, I really wasn't worried. I never had a thought in my head that he was going to die. I don't know why, because that's a scary situation and he should. The only thing they told me to do was, he said, he said, call Patrick Scales and tell him to hook up with you. And I was like, oh, I'm riding to work. <laughs> you know, I'm going to work and I'm working at a place that honestly, in the natural at that time, I hated. <laughs> I'd cry on the way to work because how bad I didn't want to work, but I was married. And that was put in me. You take care of your marriage. You know, you do whatever you got to do. You work where you work. You did this, you can't quit, right? Um, so that was instilled in me. So I was like, oh, going here and here and from. But I sit there and he says, call Patrick Scales. And I'm like, hmm. I don't know, that's the devil. <laughs> it could be the devil, right? I don't want to do that. But anyway, I called him and I said, I said, the only thing I need from you, Pastor Shields, is a hookup. I said, Courtney's dad just went into ICU. He's unconscious on a ventilator. And I said, the only thing that we want to happen is for him to wake up so we can know that he is saved. That's all we want. And I said, the only thing I need for you to agree is to agree with me and lock up. 
to hook up. I don't know why he told me to call Patrick Kelly. I have no idea. He could have told me to call anybody in that moment. I would have called him. <laughs> but he told me to call him. And I was like, all right. So he did. The I think a day later, he woke up from uh, being out of it and everything got up and we walked in there. And it was hard for us to get in there, just us two. You know, you're a little nervous. How do I ask somebody this that I've been around for the whole time? You know, you got a little bit of this and you have to break that off of you. And I remember whenever we asked him, and I can't even remember what we said, I do remember that he said, oh, is that all you want? He said, that's it. He said, let's do it now. He said, we'll do it now. You know, so the Holy Spirit orchestrates everything. He gets people's hearts where they need to be in that moment. So you don't need to be worried about anything. You just need to make sure that you're constantly with somebody, caring for them and everything, and loving them, because the Lord is doing something even when you don't think it. You know, if I kept seeing my uh, sister Tabitha, and every time I saw her, I said, sinner, going to hell. Not no love there. <laughs> you know, that that's not anything. I just have to, when I see her, I just smile, hug her, act like nothing's wrong. Do I have stuff that comes against me that I see she posts different things and everything? Because I try to be her friend on different stuff, and I'm like, ugh. Yes, I have that stuff come against me, but I just have to go to Jesus. And I just have to take it away, so that way whenever I see her, all she gets is you. Because that's the only, only thing that's going to bring anybody to Jesus is that love, having that kindness for them. And the last place and the last thing for this uh, sermon is number 10 is freedom to discover your purpose. So you get a freedom to discover what God wants to do in and through you. And this is going to be in the Amplified Version of Ephesians 2.10. It says, For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us taking paths which he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, live in the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. So a lot of people read this and they say, well, I don't really have a choice. I don't have a free will. Yeah, you do, because if you don't choose Jesus, you can choose whatever other path you want to go. So you get the freedom to discover what God has planned for you. And if you walk in his, he's already prepared it ahead of time, and it's living the good life. Amen. It's not living the bad life. If you go where Jesus wants you to go, that path he's predestined, he's predestined every argument you're going to have how to get out of it in him. He's already got it set up. He already knows what to say, when to say, how to say, what to do, every situation. And he's already lined it up to where you never experience anything in this life that's not him. But we constantly... Good life, bad life, good life. Because if you if you go and reckon with your own feelings, you're in the bad life. So you need to get to the good life. And he's already done that. He's predestined it so that way you don't ever have to worry about anything. And then in the Passion version of this uh, verse, this is where we're close. He says, we have become his poetry, a recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each of us. So we're his poetry. Poetry is pretty. Poetry is nice. Poetry has a flow to it. It's something not many people say, I hate poetry, unless they're young and they're having to learn it. You know, if you hear poetry, it's, it's nice to be around. You can be like, oh, those words are nice. They're all knitted together real perfectly. That's what Jesus wants to do in your life. He wants to knit those words perfectly so that way people are like, oh, I want to be around them. They're so easy to be around. I love being around them. They just tell me good stuff. They uplift me. They do all this stuff. Because even the world wants to be around people who uplift them. You know, that, that's, that's what they desire. They desire love, and they don't know how to get it. He says, for we are joined to Jesus, who's the anointed one. Even before we were born, God planned in advance our destiny and the good works we would do to fulfill it. So that's why you can't have anything in you thinking that you did anything. Because he's already done what you're supposed to fulfill. You just need to be happy when you're walking in him. That's where your freedom comes from. I'm, I'm good with Jesus. You need if, if you want to make sure you're good with anybody, make sure you're good with him. Amen. He's the only one that matters. Be good with Jesus. Be tied to him so that way you know that you're at peace. That's where real peace comes when you know that you're doing what he tells you to do, how to do it, what to do it, how to say it. And it just makes it so easy. That's just a peaceable, quiet life, just living with Jesus, loving with Jesus, not loving out of my flesh, because if I loved out of my flesh, I could have probably threw Marley into a wall a few times, you know, not really, but, you know, there's things where you get irritated. I could probably have gotten many fights if I don't love through Jesus, but Jesus has told me many times, walk out the door, 
shut your mouth, you know, whatever he wants to say to me in that moment, stop talking, yes, sir, let me go out here, I'm frustrated, breathe it out, Holy Spirit, help me, I want to choke him, no, don't choke him, I want to slap him, no, don't slap him, I want to be done with him, no, I'm not done with you. I mean, Jesus wouldn't, I mean, Jesus got stabbed and still loved that guy who stabbed him on the cross. You know, he's sitting there, they're checking him, everything, they're beating him, he's still loving them, people are ripping him off. Why? Because Jesus realized and he already made allowances ahead of time that they are just doing what they're doing out of the flesh or out of the devil. And when you realize who's really behind it, it doesn't bother you in the spirit. So you got to realize in your life who's behind anything. If you're irritated with somebody, call them. Tell them you're sorry for being irritated because you got the forgiveness too that you got to get out of you. I'm irritated with you, but I love you. You know, Lord's working it out. I love you. I'm irritated. It doesn't matter. None of this matters. You know, the only thing that matters is get to heaven. I love you. Jesus loves you. You can be mad at me still if you want to be mad at me, but I'm not mad at you. I love you. Hit, hit somebody with that. You know, because it don't matter. Only thing that matters with you is your walk with Jesus. So that's all I got. We'll go into if anybody needs prayer uh, this morning for anything. If you have um, need to come back to Jesus, need to get forgiveness for anything that's in your life, uh, need to be healed of anything, you can come up. I can pray for you. Uh, you can pray at your chair, whatever you want to do. If anybody needs anything from me, you can raise your hand and put it back down. Yes, ma'am. I need some. Relief on my back. I'm ready to have surgery. I'm tired of hurting. I'm tired of taking medicine. I mean, it's just like a band aid. It's not helping. I mean, it's helping temporarily, but I have struggled with this every day with my back. So I need you to put hands on me and pray for me. And I come up there. Mm -hmm. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for uh, touching Ms. Brenda right now. I thank you that her back is going to line up correctly. I thank you that you're the orchestrator of everything in our bodies. I think you know exactly where it needs to be. I thank you that if there's any inflammation, any nerves, any tendons in the wrong spot, you're taking it out. You're shrinking it. You're making it back in the place it needs to be. I just thank you, Lord, that as she gets up and walks around, if she feels any type of pain, immediately, Holy Spirit, speak to her mind to say that you're my strength. Heal me, Lord. Thank you for manifesting my healing, Lord. I thank you I have my healing, Lord, because you healed me 2,000 years ago on the cross. Thank you, Lord, that you've already done it. You said we are healed. So I just thank you for the manifestation of your promise, Lord, and that her back will be perfect, 100% perfect. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Say a prayer and then go ahead and head on out. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the service. I thank you for this time. Holy Spirit, I thank you for your word. I thank you for correction, your love, your forgiveness of us. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that as people go out <clears throat> this week, that you're really going to speak to them what they need to do to be and live like you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.